If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Ruthie, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 297 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Great to have you back for what's sure to be the squishiest episode ever. This is a classic one. My guest today is Monique Raymond, Foley artist. What is Foley? It's a unique sound effect technique that involves creating and performing everyday sounds for movies and television shows. It brings those visuals to life. Monique is a Foley expert, and she's got a million stories to share, and that's coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, if you're hungry or feel you may be about to become hungry, Listen to my conversation with Chef Mike Harris, former executive chef of McDonald's. He's spilling all the McDonald's secrets. What is the McRib? Why is that ice cream machine always broken? I tell you, but I need you to listen. Before you go listen to Chef Mike, we're diving into Foley with Foley expert Monique Raymond. That's coming up right now. All right, everyone, I'm excited to introduce my next guest, three-time Emmy Award winner, CEO of Channel 1111. Did I say it? 11111? You can say it that way. You can say it 1111. However, it's 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 a series of ones. 1111. That's good too. Yoga instructor, Foley artist, master for television and film. So much, so much. Welcome to the show, Monique Raymond. Hello. Thank you. You even said my name correctly. That's so exciting. That's so rare. Your last name is how I would hope it would sound. Like I would go, Raymond, it sounds... That would be a hope, but if I leave my name, you know, as a reservation at a restaurant, I'll say Monique Raymond, and they say, oh, you mean Raymond. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> I, oh, I should have thought of that years ago. I love they're correcting you on your own name. I My name's difficult, too, because it's, it's D-W-O-S-K-I-N, but it's pronounced Dwa. Like, so it's like Dwaskin, but it's, it's an O, not an A. So I mean, no one ever gets my name right. And sometimes they throw an R in there. Everyone knows better than us, Monique. There we go. I've, I've never tried Dwaskin. I feel like I say it funny. Dwaskin. No, you, you got it. You, you say it with such flair and confidence. <laughs> I was going to show you a prop that was funny, but I'm going to wait on that. Let me, let me go get it real quick. I'll be right back. Okay. An ordinary person, the prop that I just went to retrieve for Mr. Waskin is a styrofoam container from a very fine sushi dinner I had last night. And there's no sushi to be found, but it parlays into the story of Foley. So when it comes up, I'm going to remember to grab it. It'll be relevant. I am looking forward to it. I, I watched a whole video of you doing Foley. Why don't we explain real quick what a Foley artist is and does? All right. Foley has a rich history. I don't know all of it. <laughs> what it is for film or TV or video games, I fill in sounds. They'll say, oh, you do sound effects. And it's like, well, we do them tactily. So instead of going from a library of sounds that were pre recorded, we custom create sounds. So you got somebody like me with a room full of organized clutter and I have a bunch of pair of shoes maybe a hundred and a bunch of props and so you know like in a scary movie when you see a close-up of the murderer's feet going down an alley and they maybe step on some you know crackle of, uh, of asphalt or, or broken glass or stomp out a cigarette right before they pull out a knife to swing to kill I make all of those rather human sounds. You know, if it's a car crash, I don't do the brake squealing, but I'll do not the full force of the impact because they'll cut that in. They'll help the out with effects. But I will do something like take a car door and smash it on the ground, you know, and then we'd have the shattering of the, the broken debris as, you know, hits the ground. So it's, it's, that's what I do or that's what I've done. It's fascinating. I watched 
like a video, like Fear Factor. There was a lot of stuff that they were doing for Fear Factor. It was like they were eating cockroaches or something. And you were making yeah. the noise of their chomping, I guess. It was like, you said tactile, which is interesting because it's like you kind of feel the sounds that you're making. It's not like a squeak of the floor or something like that. It's like kind of like, kind of like when you hear a chalkboard thing go and you go, ooh, because it's like with the Fear Factor stuff, it was like pouring like, uh, I don't know, worms or stuff over someone. And it's like the sound, you had to make up the sound that that makes because it really doesn't make a sound. And like the wipeout stuff was hilarious. Like getting punched in the face with like these things and you're making sounds and it's like. <laughs> it's such a silly, fun, and sometimes tedious way to make a living. Like anything, you know, it's a lot of work. It's fun work, but it's a lot of it. And it's very intense because if we're either making the sound or we're gathering the prop to make the sound. So it's never like, you know how you can kind of zone out at some jobs, you know, stare into the into space, check your phone. No, there's none of that. You can check your phone, but it's not going to do as good a work. Did you know about Foley before? I mean, you're in the industry, so I'm sure you, you're familiar. I know sound effects. And I was at a thing once at one of the Disney things that used to have a thing where you went there and they would show you the sound effects. But like you said, I think this is a little different. So if you're doing like the Fear Factor video that I saw, I'll reference that real quick. So anyone wants to see it and I'll put a link to it in the show notes because it's fascinating. So do you know they're like, all right, Monique, we're crunching on some cockroaches and we got some worms falling into a bucket or whatever, or into a <laughs> bucket of a person or whatever. You're like, all right. And then you're like, uh, you walk in the room with like, this is my props that I feel I'm going to work with for this. Fear factor was, it was early enough in my career. And even now, if you were to give me something abstract like that, you know, you got to sort of build it. We did a lot of trial and error because nobody really knows what it sounds like to chomp down on a cockroach, or most people don't. You know what you would imagine it to be, and you want to create that reality for people in a more hyper real way than perhaps it would be. But I don't know. I, I've, I've smashed those things in the kitchen. And there's a little crunch that does happen. So you imagine, you know how when you're chewing, you hear you're chewing because it's within your own head. Mm -hmm. so, so I would go with sort of a hyper reality. So you'd get the feeling from the that the contestant is experiencing as they're having to chew that roach as opposed to what the outside observer sees. But it can't cross a certain line because then it sounds fake and then people don't buy it and then it's all a waste. So after they film it, they give it to you. So you're putting it in post? Yes. Yeah, so after the film is shot and or, or TV show is shot and is edited and hopefully picture is locked and they're not going to add anything or take anything away, then we're given the task. So it's myself and sometimes a partner, but mostly for most of my career, I've worked alone. Fully back in the day when there was a budget, it used to always be two people. And now it's only two people at the union houses. And a lot of my work, even though it was on union projects, somehow they were all done at these, you know, boutique places, which I preferred. I've worked at the union houses and it's sort of like factory work when you're with those guys. So anyway, with a show like Fear Factor, so you've got myself and I've got a bunch of props. At that point, we were doing that show across from Universal City Nissan next to the porn place. We were in a, a glass... <laughs> A glass building that now looks like Darth Vader called the Centrum Building. And we were next to where the where all the porn was being produced across from Universal City Nissan. And there was a cafe downstairs that had a very limited offering. I'd go, God, all right, so Fear Factor, I know that we're going to have to do worms and cockroaches. What are we going to do for cockroaches? And, and so I'll buy like what well, something for the shells, shell, you know, pasta shells, um, uh, no, no, it's too high end, maybe. And so then I think about Brazil nuts and different nuts. So I combine these different things between what I have on hand, what I can get at the cafe downstairs, or if I have to, I'll go to Ralph's. And then we experiment with, does this, do we buy this? And so the recordist that's mixing me will tell me like, mm -mm, too squishy to this, we need more, because he's, I'm not hearing the sound as he's hearing it with the way the mic picks it up. So that's another consideration. It's a very collaborative effort. And so my friend Glenn 
who I worked with for years. I worked with him on Survivor. And I don't talk about Survivor on that video because I sat in NDA. And for some reason, I signed NDAs with Fear Factor people too. But I just don't feel like they would sue me. I don't know about Survivor. I don't know. That's fine. So, okay. So you're, you do a crunch. Oh, yep. that's, and then like, how many times do you cycle through it? Go, okay, that wasn't right. All right. We need to uh, add some Brazil nuts, you know, or, and then you guys are going, okay, that was good, but it went too long. His mouth stopped moving and you were still. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a combination of like with a podcast, you know, one edits. So this does go through an editing process, but basically they don't want to edit each chomp. Nobody has the budget or the time to have an editor sit there. So I basically have to get it between one tenth of a second accurate. So they could bump an entire region three frames. So if I, Foley artists are always, most don't have perfect sync. I mean, I guess there might be some, but usually people are either a couple frames early or a couple frames late, which is like a tenth of a tech second, two tenths of a second. And so that way the editor knows to just bump everything and it pretty much is going to lay in. So if you mess up beyond that, yeah, you got to re re-record it. If the sound, if Glenn is saying, yeah, I'm not buying it, we need more of this, we need more of this, then I have, I have to keep doing it until we do. The clients, they're paying for us to be professionals and and to know how to make this work. And when you first start a show like Survivor or Fear Factor, when you start it, you don't have any basis of what the show is supposed to sound like. Maybe it's never been foleyed before. So then you get to build it and figure out what it is. And then after you've done a few seasons, it's like a little bit more like clockwork. Oh, we got the cockroaches here. We got the worms here. We got, the, you know, we got the different things we use. So is there certain tools that you're always using? And then it sounds like though you bring in like, oh, those boots over there that I haven't worn in three years might be good for this. Or like, uh, hey, grab me, uh, grab me that pasta. I need that or whatever it is, right? I need this rice. Yes. No, we have, we literally, you know, on the stage, literally there's a room full of props, you know, and there's like, sporting goods and different types of balls. There's dishes, there's sticks, there's breakable wood, there's different pits for different surfaces, you know, sand, gravel, concrete wood, creaky wood, hollow wood, different so that we literally recreate. And this, you know, this is, this is back in the old radio days. They would have, you know, remember they would have the guy with the coconut shells that would be, you know, right, right, right. In fact, radio is really hard. I once got a, I think it was like a NPR or some sort of public radio, PBS, something something good. I had to do an Edgar Allan Poe radio show. It's a lot easier when you're watching picture as the audience, you buy it more, the sounds, than necessarily if it's just audio. For example, a cigarette burn. I don't know if any of y'all smoke, but it doesn't really make any sound. But think about a movie where you hear that. Right. That's it's cool, right? flash. Yes. And so how we do that, there's a bunch of different ways to do that. I used to, because I kind of had to train myself. I've had, I had a couple of mentors for short periods of time, but for the most part, I had to just figure it out. And so it was it, very creative for me, but it was a very, it was difficult. There was no book to go to. And if you happen to meet another folio artist back then, they certainly weren't telling you what they used because back then nobody wanted to train anybody because they don't want people working for cheap that they train. So there's no like specific like tools of the trade other than your imagination and pretty much anything, depending on what the task at hand is. Correct. And so you have to be careful. I remember one time when I was first starting, I was trying to build up my personal, for a while I had a personal kit, meaning I could go because I worked in a number of different boutique studios and I know that they all have different props and different things. And I'm certainly not going to bring a whole studio with me, but I had you know, like a makeup artist or a construction worker, you know, you've got your toolkit of things you bring. So I would bring things like keys, handcuffs, dog paw gloves, police belts, you know, the things that one police caution tape, a Zippo lighter, a Bic lighter. I had a favorite pine cone I used that was really trashed. And whenever I would manipulate my fingers along the spiny parts of the pine cone, it sounded, it could sound like, like critters walking, like cockroaches. Pine cone. I don't know. How did I figure that out? I don't know. It's just trial and error. 
Sorry to interrupt. Squish, squish, squish. That's just me doing some of my own Foley. Can't afford <laughs> to hire Monique. I did. I do want to thank everyone for their support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations. And that's how we keep the lights on. And now back with Monique. So then are there some things like the pine cone that might work great when paired with the visual, but not work when it's just radio, audio only? Yeah, you know, I don't know. For example, like I just got a call from a, from a guy I met that works for Sirius XM. And he said well, he was interested in, in hearing my work for, for something. And he wanted some really, really gory blood dripping, like beaker bending blood. And so if you had a picture and I took a wet chamois like you wash your car with, and I, and I got it nice and wet and I just kept massaging it. After a while, it starts making this like gushy sound that could sound like when you're watching a scene where there's like blood and slosh, like blood has a different viscosity than water. It's thicker. But if you use more viscous fluids in a Foley session, you don't get as much sound. And then you hear the slap of whatever the surface is with that's holding the liquid. So it's, it's like a weird trick, like you're trying to, and if you have picture to watch to sell that blood, it's going to be a little easier, I think, than for me, I'm going to be sending this guy from Sirius samples of the goopy blood. Well, all you're going to hear is like, you know, and it's like, well, I, that was terrible. I don't have the, but, but you know what I'm saying? All you're going to hear is the, and if you don't have the visual, hopefully what he's talking about, or, you know, hopefully he sets it up to where the audience can go, oh, that's blood. Other than that, they'll be going, what's that weird gushing sound? <laughs> and um, how do we stop it? What was your biggest Foley win? Like where you're like, oh, I nailed that one. <laughs> it's so funny because it's easier to track one's losses than one's wins. But I'd have to say my big aha moment was when I stopped taking things so literally. Like even if we're in a room with hundreds of props, you don't have everything in the world that's going to be in a movie world, right? And remembering that the mixer can really have an impact by EQing, like I could move a 30 pound boulder and scrape it along concrete and the person mixing me can ump, bump up the bass and do some tricks to make it sound like Indiana Jones's cave is being, you know, moved like a huge boulder there. So it's part me, part the skill of the mixer and the equipment and the tools at hand. So my biggest win, that was a long roundabout way to say, my biggest win was, and I realized that I was working on the gray man. It's a Ryan Gosling tent pole thing that came out a year and a half ago. And it's got Chris Adams, Billy Bob, or it's got good people. And it's, a, I like the film a lot. And I was working with a really great mixer whom I've worked with, you know, off and on for many years named Darren Mann. He's incredible. Darren's worked on some of the biggest movies. He's on Batman. But anyway, Darren's a fantastic mixer. And we were doing this scene where Gosling was trying to release himself from some sort of, I don't know if it was a cuff, a chain or whatever, but it was something. And he was using scissors, which is completely unrealistic. But whatever he was doing, he was doing it with scissors. And I was like, yeah, it couldn't have been a chain. But he was doing something with scissors that shouldn't be done with scissors. And I was like, that sounds so, it's a, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. And so I used a machete and I held it in a way that it wasn't ringing out like a big machete. It was tight. So you would believe it was scissors. So it was, it was really my big win is when I learned that you don't have to be so literal and you can get whack creative and then you come up with cool stuff. That's awesome. So like for the gray man, like. Who, who hires you? Is it the director? Is it the, is it the Russo brothers? That would be nice. No, back early in my career, I used to meet the directors. I used to be able to go to spotting sessions and ask them questions about, is that a wood floor or is that a, you know, or, or they would tell me to focus on things that I might not have thought of, but that sort of went away. So basically for me, I'm a, an independent contractor and I have different studios that hire me and some, I was their main person, but I always like to have eggs in many baskets. You never know what could happen. I, I've seen people, I, I remember a long time ago, there was one girl, she really wanted to work for Sony. That's all she wanted to work for Sony. And she would dump everything else to work for Sony. And then she finally got in at Sony, lost all her, you know, little indie guys. And then after a year, something happened politically and she got let go. She couldn't go get back and get all those little jobs back because 
somebody else was, you know, doing them. So to answer your question, a post supervisor, I might have an interaction with and the post supervisor handles the sound effects, the backgrounds, the dialogue, the ADR, the Foley, I'm just one of the things. Sometimes the, you know, sometimes the supervisor talks to the the person, the mixer, the recordist. And other times we just, just they just hand it to us and they're just like, go. Because they know that we're good. And every once in a while, there's notes, but, you know, to focus on a certain thing. Or uh, one time I did a whole movie. It was really, it was a B movie at best. It was like a D movie. And it was like a, a sniper kind of thing. Sniper knockoff movie. And I remember that it was military guys and they had military gear. And they were running around for the whole movie. The sniper, the military guys, whatever. And so I was jangling the, you know, the gun, the cuffs, whatever, the baton, whatever they've got. And I'm sort of, and you have to do that in... The entire, it's like, it's like the, through the, the entire film, you have to jiggle this stuff that people are wearing it. And so you want to get it right, because that's a lot of work and it takes a long time and you have to time it right, everything. And so, you know, we got the sound approved by the supervisor, did the whole film that way. And then the co-supervisor listened and, you know, played it for the director and said, oh no, we want it way more exaggerated. So I had to go back and do the whole thing on the 4th of July. For free. It'd be interesting to hear, to watch a movie without Foley, because it, it must be visually boring, right? I mean, it, might, it must, there's some a sense of surrealness to it. It'd be like watching a home movie. Well, you know. <laughs> kind of when, seeing something happen, but it's not, you're not feeling it. You know, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll take, for example, my Foley from years of working on a project, you know, say I worked on a cartoon for a few years, and then one day... They just said, oh, you know what? We don't really have the budget for full anymore. So thank you very much, Monique. We're not going to be needing you. Because then it saves them the money. It saves them the money for the stage, myself and the mixer. And they're just going to cut in from the years of work I'd already given them. So, you know, there's a lot of that kind of thing going on. I feel like it's really on its way out, to be honest, fully here in the in the U.S. and Canada. Because... That video that you mentioned, that insider video about Fear Factor and Wipeout, after that, it, you know, it brought on, maybe it was happening before, but I know for sure after that video went viral on TikTok, it got 9 million views in a week. 9 million views in one wow. week. I didn't even know they were putting it on TikTok. You know, I just knew about YouTube uh, thing. They'd featured Foley before. Uh, some of the ones they'd featured before were really, really, really very, very good, you know, with different artists. And mine, the TikTok thing kind of it sort of caused certain other... Foley artist to be like, I want to be TikTok famous. And so it's almost like David Copperfield going, I want to be TikTok famous and showing how everything's done to the world. Because I'm not just competing with Toronto, Atlanta, Austin, New Mexico. They all have big tax breaks compared to Los Angeles. But now I'm competing with Bollywood, Argentina, Thailand, where people make pennies on the dollar. And now with technology being such as it is, they don't need somebody. I, I worked on a Netflix film a couple of years ago, and it had a, a horse, a lot of horse equine stuff in it, you know, and there's saddle tack hooves you have to do. The guy who owned the studio said, yeah, don't worry about the horse. I farmed that out to Argentina. And the thing is, is that I can't compete with Argentina. The one thing that we had, the one thing we had was we had our secrets. And I'm not saying, you know, because I had some people, you know, some Foley artists along the way tell me how to do bone breaks or something, you know, what to use. Eventually, because they said, just because we tell you how to do it doesn't mean we show you have the years we have of doing it because there's a finesse. There's a way you handle things. But guess what? If you show people on TikTok how you do everything it's only a matter of time before they're that good. That's a downer, isn't it? What kind of caught me also is that they are allowed to use your work product that you already got paid for and reuse it. Yeah, because I'm a work for hire, see? You know, so these studios hire me. I don't even know who owns the sound. I don't know if it's who owns the studio or I don't know if it's the client. But what I know is that it's not me. Do you prefer animation over live action? You've done a lot of superhero stuff. You've done a lot of animation, live action. I prefer getting paid in a prompt fashion at a very good rate. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen anymore either. You know, I make the same amount now basically as I did 20 years ago when gas was $1.17 a gallon and you could rent a nice two-bedroom apartment in Silver Lake. I actually was a homeowner before. Now I have a nice apartment. When I first started, we were recording onto one or two inch tape. And as the technology improves, when we switch to being able to 
record digitally, we then, you didn't need all the equipment to have a studio and you could open up these little boutique operations affordably. And you could even do this in your garage or, you know, make a home studio if you built it outright. And so that drove the price down um, because people were willing to work for less. I think to answer your question in a less sarcastic way, I love animation. I love live action. Whatever is good. I really have a hard time working on bad things, even if I'm getting paid well. I've turned down work, literally, if something is going to bum me out or, or if I have a moral objection to it. A moral objection. Yeah. I, I, there's certain, like, I don't do torture porn. You don't do what? Torture I, porn? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a friend who worked on one of the saws, you know, and I've done oh, Texas Chainsaw. Porn. I've okay. done. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned yeah, porn just, earlier, I, so I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, early on, I had to do softcore. Remember when they had those late night cable things that was like these channels, like at night, they would have these sort of softcore porn. It wasn't HBO, Cinemax. but it was those I other. Know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I used to work on those. This <laughs> is well, that was awkward. <laughs> having to imagine, like, what's having to do, like, blowjob foley, you know, when you're working with somebody you you don't know. It's not my friend Glenn. It's like some strange man that I've never met before. And there's, you know, anyway, it just <laughs> <laughs> some stranger. But you've you've won three Emmys. Yes. Do the Oscars cover? Do the Academy Awards cover foley, or just TV? bastards no i don't know what it is or why it is but the academy does not recognize foley as see in television we're part of the editors guild so when we get an emmy it's a group award it's for the entire editorial team oddly enough the recordist is a different category it's like they're part of the mixer team but anyhow it's group awards and for whatever reason, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences only gives it to the post supervisor, it does not give it to any of the departments underneath. They don't get the option of a statue. They just get to say they worked on that wonderful movie. So what are the challenges uh, faced when doing Foley for a SpongeBob SquarePants? SpongeBob SquarePants. One of the challenges for that was that I didn't create the original sounds. So there was a there was a Foley artist that did. And her name was Monette. Oddly, I owe some of my career to Monette because when I first started, people thought that I was Monette because I am Monique and our names are so similar. So they'd hire me expecting me to be much better than I was because I was new and she'd been at it a long time. Monette started SpongeBob and built the sounds with whatever props it was she used. And when she left the show, I don't know what, under what circumstance, but she was no longer on the show after a few seasons. Then another artist picked up the show and he had to try to replicate what she did without knowing what she was using. So that's really tricky. Um, and then when that guy was doing Passion of the Christ or something at Sony, I would fill in and do, and then I would do have to do SpongeBob. So I'd have to figure out not only what her thing and what his thing, and all of it. And the hardest part was getting Squidward right. Squidward has not only footsteps, which... I think I used kind of like big, those big black rubber gloves, not the little yellow Playtex one, but those big industrial like for chemicals gloves. I think I just, you know, slapped on those for the steps, but they also wanted a sound just for his movement, kind of much like I was saying with the, with the jangly guys, the military people. Well, animation characters might have a squeak as they walk or, and Squidward did. And we always would get into this thing of like, no, Monique, that sounds too much like a creak. It needs to sound like a squeak. And I'm like, that must drive you crazy. My goodness. What is it like when you're working on, um, do you enjoy, I say, rather working on a show like Gossip Girl or Mad Men where you've done 35 plus episodes of each? And like, do you get a kind of a feel for it? You're like, oh, he's, you know, he's drinking scotch again. Just use that clink or whatever. It's fun if it's a, to work on a bunch of something, if you're a fan of it like to get paid to watch Mad Men. Awesome, right? There's some other shows on there that I don't want to mention. There's some that I've done a lot of that I wasn't a fan of, but then I would have fun with whoever I was working, making fun of the show. You know, we would just like laugh. At the, at the... Let's just say Mad Men for a second. Is You're doing Mad Men. You do 42 episodes over four years or so, but you're not really, you don't know anyone there, right? I mean, like, no, no, we don't get any swag. 
We don't get invited to the parties or any of it. No. Post is like the bastard stepchild, especially Foley. I mean, maybe the post supervisor, they'll remember because the post supervisor interfaces with the client. Very easy to forget about the people that you don't even know about, that there's no relationship. Is it weird then? Like, because like you must have, especially if it's something you love, like Mad Men, you're watching it over and over again, right? So you've spent 42 episodes, you've spent hours upon hours upon hours watching this. You know them intimately, but they don't know you. It's very true. And you know, it's very sad. The reason that I stopped working on Mad Men was that the, well, first of all, <laughs> the supervisors that worked on the show, they never told the show's creator. They never told him that they fully, because he was only wanted to use production sound and he was a control freak. And so they would sneak it in. So not only did I not know anybody, it's like, I almost like they want to bury me. They don't want to. And Jeff Probst from Survivor wanted to feature me on a behind the scenes thing. And the rest of the producers like, no, no, no. We don't want them to know that reality is not reality. Yeah, it's a little odd. Well, Survivor, you did 241 episodes or so. Like you did a lot. That's my daughter's favorite show, by the way. <laughs> It's a good show. You know, I remember watching, I started on season three. They do 20 episodes a season or something, or no, or something like that. And they do two seasons a year. So you can, there's a lot of Survivor happening. And it was so funny because people were like, oh, how was it to go to, I'm like, I went to Universal City Nissan across the street in a glass building next to the foreign place. It's like, I have not gotten to go to any of these exotic locations, but I get less mosquito bites here. Sorry to interrupt, have to take a quick break. And we're back. Yeah, sometimes knowing the behind the scenes, like I remember, like I was, I watched the original Survivor. So, and I think that was sort of like the beginning of this whole reality world like this, where then they would show clips and it'd be like, oh, no, 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 we, um, we reshot them swimming across this channel because we needed it to look better. That's not necessarily fully, but they would do things like where it was like, oh, what you were seeing wasn't the reality that you thought you were seeing. <laughs> it was a version of that reality that they made sure looked good on camera. And those things, they can't possibly get the sound. So for those competitions, if it weren't for us, they would be so dry. We would get Survivor and it wouldn't have the music. The music track wasn't married to pictures. We would play it without the music so we could hear as much of the production sound as possible. And that show is literally so dry without music and the effects and the foley because that's what builds like imagine those competitions they can't have somebody running around with a boom mic chasing people you know through the jungle in, in in competitions and when they're out in the ocean and think about it they're you know lavalier mic packs those sound awful for this so we're building all of that so it was a good run survivor was a good run paid my mortgage <laughs> You worked with uh, Adam Sandler a couple of times, at least little Nikki. I can blame you for little Nikki. I, oh my God. You can't blame me for the content. I worked on Anger Management was a better film. I did an animated Sandler film too. And I did that at this place, uh, Guaranteed Media. I, uh, it's no longer there, but Elmo Weber still works with Adam. And Sandler, I got to say, the nicest guy. Like whenever he would, he would remember the post people. He would do nice things like buy a basketball hoop for the parking lot or a ping pong table for the studio. And he, you know, and I met him, sweetheart of a guy, but God, those movies, some of those were just, little Nicky was just terrible. Some of Adam Sandler's movies are my favorite. Like I can watch Waterboy on repeat. I love Waterboy. <laughs> Big Daddy. Yeah, I, I, There's some really good ones. And then Little Nicky. I think I might have. Oh, I know. Little Nicky. I, anger management was okay. Pretty good, yeah. That's the one with Jack Nicholson? Yeah. But here's the thing. That gig, I lost that gig because Elmo, the owner of the facility and the post, you know, the mixer, everything, the big guy, he started dating a Foley artist and then they got married. So it's like, there went my, <laughs> there went my Sandler jobs. Oh, that's a bummer. What about working with Sam Raimi? Drag me to hell. That was so hard. Paul, the supervisor, had just won the Oscar for The Hurt Locker. And I met Paul and it was a disaster because there's normal things that one does in Foley that are just kind of givens. Like when a character walks and they come to a stop, there's kind of a scuff. It's not like you just all of a sudden abruptly go heel-toe, heel-toe, heel-toe. It's usually like 
heel toe, heel toe. You know, there's just a, a something to your stoppage. I don't know how to explain it very well, but there is. But Paul was like, I don't like scuff stops. Okay. And there are all these things, you know, and he wanted to hear interior throat phlegm. You know, there was a, a character of a woman that had like phlegm in her throat. And you can't just squish a chamois like you do for worms for fear factor. It needs to sound like it's inside a cavernous space. And at that time, I didn't know about the trick that I could have learned from another Foley artist, but had I, you know, not had to teach myself so much. But you can get a lavalier mic and stick it in the cavity of a chicken, like a raw chicken or a roasted chicken from the store and record. And that sounds like you're inside of a thing. But I didn't know that. So trying to do that for him was really, 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 it was, it was, he was picky. It was hard. And we had technical problems and the sounds that he was needing. Some of them were very abstract. Like there was a woman that drove a Prius and he wanted interior car rattle. You and I all know that a Prius makes no rattle. And so how do you do something that makes sense? That doesn't seem stupid. That's still following what this Oscar winning guy <laughs> wants. Does the Prius people then call? Do you get one day you're like, we got the Prius people on the phone. They want to know why they were making their car rattle. They're upset. <laughs> the Prius lawyers are on the phone. We, got, we got, They need to talk to you right away. They want to mm. sue you for rattle noises. <laughs> My God. I mean, they go out of their way. I mean, the only reason those cars make any noise in the exterior is because pedestrians were getting hurt, you know, because people didn't see them, hear them. Then now they have that little whirring sound, like Tesla has a sound and Toyota has a sound. It's quiet, but it's a sound. There's no interior car rattle. Do you like working on like Teen Titans Go and you did a lot of Avengers Assemble, those animation? Do you like superheroes because yeah. there's a sort of a surrealness to it? Yeah, I mean, all of it's really cool. Animation's cool because you're building it all from the ground up. There's no production sound. So for, for something like Mad Men, something like that, the production sound was excellent. You know, sometimes people be like, that sounds really good when you put on Betty's boots. And I'm like, that was production. But I, you know, but with something like animation, there is nothing. There is nothing. So you build every single thing. It feels to me the most creative. And then Stargirl, which isn't on anymore, but like that's a live action superhero. Can you use some of that animation knowledge and reuse some of those things? Or is it a different world when you can see it more? It's realistic. It's a little bit of a different world with live action. I couldn't, you can bring it up just a tad, but basically with Foley, it's like if you know we're there, we're, it's being mixed wrong or it was recorded wrong or it was just wrong. If you're aware of the Foley and you go, God, that Foley, because it should blend, it should accentuate what's happening. It, you know, and you could do a very stylistic thing, I guess. And, and in fact, I actually wrote a project that's about a psychological thriller about a Foley artist. And I have this fantasy of not doing the Foley on it myself and having somebody else do it. Is that weird? It's, it's weird. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not here to judge you. I think uh, okay. I'll do the Foley for you. I'll do like, uh, oh, no, here comes. There we go. And that's it's so weird. Like, for example, like that simple action of crinkling the paper or moving the printer paper. Printer paper is of a different thickness than like legal pad paper. So like in Foley, size matters, you know? It's like everything sounds very specific to its... Like you can't make that piece of paper you had. I mean, I guess that they could equalize it and try to thin it out, but it's like you have to... I hear you. There's, there's a science and an art to it of which you are a master, nominated a million times, winner of many, many <laughs> awards. You're like God of Foley. Well, no, there's, there's, there's many good gods. <laughs> and God, goddesses, goddesses of... Goddess of Odie, goddess. Talk to me about channel 1111, as they say. Shut it's up. not 11111. 11111. Channel 1111 is a, um, my foundation that I started to do enlightening, conscious raising events and PSAs and filmed entertainment in order to make the world a better place. I have a superhero complex myself, and I guess I'm probably more of a, I just want to help elevate. I think there's a lot of darkness, especially now in our political climate and a lot of division. And I think humor, you know, it sort of just breaks everything down. Like you can't be mad at somebody if you're laughing. And so that was the mission behind that. And because I think for a while I've thought Foley is kind of, people used to ask, you know, oh, don't you worry that computers are going to take over? And, you know, there's libraries of Foley where you could literally 
cut in footsteps with a keyboard left right left right but it it's tedious and it doesn't sound right and better to just have a person do it right this thing is going to be ai so it's like what can we do to i'm not getting any younger and working at all those boutique studios i didn't get a pension so i'm sort of i'm transitioning and this is the prop of the sushi thing the first day that I went to work at the place where I did Survivor, Glenn, the recordist, said, grabbed one of these and he said, this sounds like a boat at a dock. And I was like, oh, on the mic, if you do it right and you're doing it to picture, it really does. And I just thought it was funny. I hadn't thought about it in years. And I was thinking about you. And then I got the sushi last night. It came in that. I hate styrofoam, but I was like, oh. It. You're killing the environment. <laughs> yeah. True, 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 true that. I've been doing these series of fuck, Mary kill videos through not the nonprofit part of channel 1111, but the um, other part, which is just the production part of it. I finally decided, you know what? I've only, you know, I've done hundreds of these and I started with fuck, Mary kill Amazon prime HBO and Netflix. And I posted them on uh, Vimeo and nobody goes to Vimeo. So I've, I've been, you know, sort of moving them over, but now there is no HBO. It's like I found with this project, if I don't post things like immediately, things become irrelevant. I did one that was Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, Queen Elizabeth while she was alive. It's like it changes tone when she's dead. You know, it's like there's a different. Right. I decided I'm, I go, you know what? I'm just going to I give up. I'm putting it on YouTube. I put some on TikTok, but then I got taken down for hate speech on one of them. And then I tried to do an ad with. YouTube, you know, like don't like that, but I just thought, you know what, it'll get more people seeing them. And then I got rejected for hate speech. I got like a, we're sorry, we cannot, because you cannot in the land of YouTube, you can say fuck, but not within the first 30 seconds. And the first right. thing in all of mine is fuck, Mary kill. It's the very first thing. But I have a disclaimer that it's a game and that we don't advocate killing anyone, but that wasn't enough for YouTube. So hopefully <laughs> people listening to this will check out my fuck Mary and kill series because it's really quite funny i'll put links to that and your foley video that we talked about and everything channel one 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 we didn't even get to yo the yoga cult or russell brand or ron jeremy there's so many things that we could talk about ron jeremy what <laughs> So Ron Jeremy's in one of my PSAs. I knew him from after a really bad relationship ended, nine and a half year relationship ended in betrayal, really bad. I was sort of like in a very vulnerable position. And that's when I, Glenn, the one that I was working Survivor and Fear Factor on, he talked me into taking a stand-up class with him. And that sort of started my whole stand-up thing. But at the same time, I was very broken and um, somebody invited me to a yoga class. And I remember the first day I went, there was... Russell Brand and Demi Moore. It was like a whole scene. It was the weirdest thing I ever saw in my life. And I've lived in LA a long time. And I'm like, what the hell is this? And there was like over a hundred people in this big studio. And what the heck? What? And it was through that experience that I joined this kind of kind of yoga. It didn't call itself a cult, but it had some culty elements. And I met a lot of celebrities there. Uh, one was Ron Jeremy. And um, Ron used to come to yoga. And he, I remember he, he, he found out I was a comedian and he and he said, uh, hey, I, I want to come over and show you some of my movies. And he's like, my comedy stuff. Not, 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 not. I'm like, all right. So I let Ron <laughs> come to my house to show me. And he would show, you know, he had, he had this, it was like a reel of all the clips of all the like the light, the night talk show hosts, you know, referencing him or some of his funny music video things he did, like Wrecking Ball and stuff. That's funny. Mm. But it's kind of sad, the whole Ron Jeremy thing. Well, Onique, this was awesome. I loved hanging yeah. out with you. Thanks for hanging out with me. All right. How amazing was Monique Raymond? I know. Will you ever watch any of these shows the same again? I don't think so. Crunch, 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 crunch. That was actually me. Who did I fool? All right. Well, with the interview over, it can only mean one thing. I know. The episode has come to an end. Can't believe it. Flew by. One more huge thank you to Monique Raymond for sharing all the Foley secrets with us. Check out Channel 1111. Check out her website. Check out F. Mary Kill. All the good stuff. All the links are in the show notes. So huge thank you to Monique. And of course, a huge thank you to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me. And I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. 
If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations.